All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Yes, it's a blizzard again, and yes, we are brewing a stout in it again. Uh, I'm actually super excited about this. This is totally not a channel tradition. It just so happened that twice in a row I was able to brew in the middle of a blizzard, and twice in a row I was making a stout. So, um, yeah, might as well continue, right? If you want to see what happened the last time I brewed a stout in a blizzard, please check out this video up here in the corner. So even though this blizzard is not really all that impressive right now, we are expecting over two feet of snow today, uh, which should be pretty fun. So I think it'll be interesting to see kind of how the accumulation goes over the course of the video. Today's video is going to be an Irish stout. Uh, so what we are doing is making our St. Patrick's Day beer for the year. Um, I haven't made an Irish stout in two years. The last time I did, I wasn't really paying attention to water chemistry and I wasn't really paying attention to uh, just kind of like how dark grains were going to interact with the actual quality of the beer. And now that I have a really good understanding of how water chemistry works for my system uh, and I've got some tools to use to kind of make that a bit of a better uh, situation for me, I'm gonna go ahead and try this all over again. Irish Stout's actually a pretty fun beer to brew, all things considered, um, and it's not too hard to make either. It's not as hard as something like a really big Imperial Stout. Um, it's a you know light-bodied, light, low alcohol stout, four and a half percent, five percent usually. They don't need a long aging period, and they're really you know most of their flavor is coming from a large addition of roasted barley, which is uh, going to give you kind of like a nice soft roastiness. Just don't make the mistake of changing out that roasted barley for black malt. Now, if you're a slightly insane person like myself and you like to brew in conditions like this, there's just a couple things to be aware of, uh, just for safety's sake and just so your brew goes off without a hitch. First, if you're using an electric system like I am, make sure that you're covering all of your electronics so that they don't get snow into them and you don't end up with a short circuit on your hands. Secondly, make sure that you also are running your recirculation the entire time, as it is about 15 degrees outside right now, well below freezing. Um, if I let the lines sit with water in them or wort in them, uh, even though it might be at 150 degrees over the course of you know, an hour or so, it's going to freeze. So you want to make sure you don't have any frozen connections, you don't want to have your pump stuck up with ice. So just make sure you're constantly running it during the entire brew and uh, everything should be fine for you. So, <laughs> big thank you to Northern Brewer for providing me the ingredients for the batch of beer that I'm going to be making today and for providing those awesome brewing TV videos from 10 years ago where they were out there doing this sort of thing in the garage in the middle of like 30 degrees below zero winters in Minnesota. Uh, love those videos. Let's go in for our recipe now. This stout recipe today is actually relatively simple and basic. It's not a Guinness clone, so it doesn't have that kind of acidic bite that Guinness has. Um, I don't actually find myself enjoying that, so I don't really want it in my Irish stout. I'm looking for a little bit maltier, kind of fuller feeling one um, than Guinness. So what we're going to start out with is seven pounds of Thomas Fawcett Maris Otter uh, base malt. It's a really good Maris Otter base malt. Um, if you can find Fawcett malts, they're among the best English malts out there. Um, we're going to add to that two pounds of flaked barley for some head retention, mouthfeel, and just overall smoothness. And then we're going to add one pound, a full pound of roasted barley uh, into the mesh just so we have that full uh, roastiness and black color. Just don't be afraid of roasted barley in a stout like this. It actually is a really key ingredient. You don't want to put it in at the very end. Sometimes I'll put roasted grains in at the very end of the mash to get all of the color and none of the bitterness or astringency. In this case, we do actually want that at the beginning of the mash. You're gonna mash everything all at the same time. And then on top of that, we're gonna add half a pound of chocolate malt for just another dimension of the roast character. Um, so having two different kinds of roasted malts in there is gonna hopefully add a little bit of complexity in that particular side of the character. For hops, we're gonna just stick with a single bittering addition at 60 minutes with an ounce and three quarters of Challenger hops. Um, and then for yeast, I'm gonna be using Imperial Darkness, uh, which is the same as Y Yeast 1084 Irish Ale, but this time I actually bought an Imperial packet of it instead. Um, it's the same yeast. It's gonna do the same thing. It's a great stout strain. It leaves a whole, I used it to ferment my Irish Red Ale with last year, and I used it to ferment my uh, maple chocolate coffee stout with um, that I just did, and both of those came out really, really nice. Um, highly recommend this yeast for anything uh, English or just even remotely dark. So for the water profile, we're doing 42 parts per million of calcium, seven parts per million of magnesium, 45 parts per million of sodium, 62 parts per million of sulfate, 
148 parts per million of chloride, 117 parts per million of bicarbonate. I'm driving the bicarbonates up as much as possible uh, to add an alkalinity buffer for the pH so that the significant amount of roasted grains we're putting into that mash are going to really drop the pH in the beer, probably down below five. We wanna add bicarbonate to that, which is your uh, alkalinity basically in the water to keep that pH from dropping too far. The only problem is my main source of alkalinity is sodium bicarbonate, uh, which increases my sodium levels. And if we go too high on the sodium levels, we're gonna start tasting saltiness in the beer. Don't want that. So I have a secret ingredient. So if the mash pH does not fall in the intended range and we end up with too acidic of a mash, I have bought myself some calcium hydroxide or food grade slaked lime. Uh, this is a very strong base um, and it is capable of changing the pH back up to the desired level, just like if we would use lactic acid for uh, if the pH was too high. So we're starting out with eight gallons of distilled water and we're adding to that two grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, three grams of calcium chloride and five grams of baking soda. And if it doesn't work, then um, we will add a little bit of calcium hydroxide or slaked lime to the mash uh, to correct the pH if needed. We're gonna mash this for an hour at 150 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to get us a nice dry finish. One of the most characteristic parts of this whole recipe is stout must be dry at the end. Um, otherwise, it's not an Irish dry stout, is it? So I'm gonna go inside and warm up while we uh, wait for the mash water to fully heat up. Um, things are gonna take a little bit longer today, uh, but it should be a whole lot of fun. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sticking around. I hope you enjoy the brew day. I added eight gallons of distilled water to my Clawhammer Supply 120 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature, uh, which took a very, very long time since it was very cold outside. But while it was heating, I measured out my water salts and I added them to the strike water and I also milled all of my grain. Once the water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bell, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash and started recirculating. Let the mash sit at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, but I took a pH reading as usual about 10 minutes in and saw a on-target pH of 5.37, so I didn't have to actually add any slaked lime to bring the pH down. Once the mash had sat for 45 more minutes, I raised to the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit, and I let it sit there for 15 minutes, and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for 15 more minutes. At this time, I fired up the controller to 100% power and tried to get as much of a jump start on the boil as possible. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering addition, which was one and three quarter ounces of Challenger. Once 50 minutes had elapsed, I added some yeast nutrient, and then 10 minutes later, I killed the boil by starting to recirculate boiling wort through the chiller and the pump. Uh, in my opinion, as always, this is just the easiest and the best way to ensure sanitation of all your chilling equipment. After being sure the inside of the chiller and the pump are all sterilized, I took the whole setup inside, hooked it up to my sink, and began chilling to 70 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Because of how cold my groundwater is during the winter, this really did not take a very long time, and I actually got it down to about 65. I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 12.3 bricks or roughly 1049. This was only about two points lower than the target OG, uh, which was good news. So even despite the crazy conditions outside, I was still able to brew a relatively on target beer. And then I transferred it into my anvil bucket fermenter, aerating by splashing, and then pitched my yeast and left it to ferment at about 65 degrees.
Sorry for some of the background noise right now. The uh, cleanup effort has begun in my neighborhood. Um, but uh, as you can see, it's still snowing. We didn't quite get our two feet of forecasted snow, but we got about a foot right now. Um, and I think it's gonna continue throughout the night. So maybe we'll actually end up with two feet by the time the morning rolls around. But either way, I wanted to talk about fermentation on this beer. Um, the whole thing is done. The whole, the brew day is all finished. Everything's actually all cleaned up right now, actually. Um, I just went ahead and got it all done. Uh, so there's a couple different ways you can go about doing this one. Um, you can ferment it with a couple different yeasts. It's an Irish dry stout. So the whole point of it is dry. You really want it to finish somewhere around 10, 10 plus or minus about two gravity points. So like 10.08 to 10.12 is about right. Um, so you want a yeast that's somewhat attenuative um, and you want to combine that, you know, with the lower mash temperatures. Irish ale yeast is definitely the go-to in this case, but you can also use English ale yeast as well with just as much success. You can also use an American ale yeast if you really want to. I wouldn't really recommend going that route because it's not traditional, but who cares? You know, it's your own beer. Another option would be to use a clean fermenting Kvike strain and ferment that nice and hot. Um, but I, again, really wouldn't recommend doing that in this case either. You want a smooth kind of profile on that, and that's something that Imperial Darkness does really well, which is why I'm using it, more so than just because it's an Irish ale yeast. The bottom line here is though, as long as it's a good attenuator, and as long as it is a somewhat clean fermenting yeast, you're gonna probably be all right, so you can use really what you want. Uh, in those situations. It's another beer that might be okay as a pressure fermentation situation. Uh, I wouldn't really recommend it overall, but it's probably not going to hurt the beer since you're not looking for too many like fruity berry esters or anything like that. So if you want to go ahead and, and uh, pressure ferment it, then go for it. In my case though, what I plan on doing is going ahead and just doing a sort of slow, somewhat cold 65-ish degree fermentation. This is very similar to what I did when I made my Imperial Coffee Stout a couple weeks ago. It's a, just a good way to get a good clean beer and avoid any unwanted esters from the yeast. So in a nutshell, what I will be doing is fermenting this at about 65 Fahrenheit uh, for about 10 to 14 days, maybe a bit longer as needed really, um, to get us down to a appropriate final gravity of about 10, 10 or so, um, which should get us around four and a half to 5% ABV. Oh, that's cold. <laughs> It shouldn't take too long. This stout doesn't really require too much time to actually age out because it's not a very strong beer. And like a lot of that astringency does go away relatively fast. If you find yourself drinking your beer, it's not quite tasty yet. That bitterness is a little too strong. Just give it another week or two and you should be good to go. Anyway, I'm very cold, but I'm also very excited to see what happens with this beer. So I will catch you guys in a couple weeks. Until then, cheers. <laughs>
And if you suck up half beer and half air and then squirt it back into your beer, um, it will actually dissolve most of the nitrogen in the air into your beer and create that nice thick foamy head. From his video it looked like it worked out pretty well and I've also seen a couple threads and homebrew talk forums that uh, have said the same thing. Now I carbonated this beer with CO2. I don't have beer gas, I don't have nitro. So we are pouring it off of CO2 but what I did get myself is this stout nozzle from Intertap. So as many of you know all of my taps are inner taps which means I can screw the nozzle on and off depending on what kind of beer I'm pouring or if I want to fill up a growler or something like that. Stout faucet is very unique though because it's not a straight pass through. It has this little plate inside called a restrictor plate. It basically takes the beer and it forces it through these very tiny holes and that knocks a whole bunch of the carbonation out of the beer. Now when you're pouring with beer gas, that CO2 that the beer is carbonated with gets knocked out of the beer by these restrictor plates and replaced with nitrogen. That nitrogen causes that super thick head and that super smooth creamy mouthfeel uh, that we all come to associate with something like Guinness on Nitro. You're not gonna get that with a CO2 beer poured through this tap. What you are gonna get, however, is a beer that has most of that CO2 knocked out of it. Not all, but most. And that's 80% of the equation for getting you a nitro pour. So just really quickly, I'm gonna demonstrate what happens when I pour this carbonated Irish stout out of a stout faucet versus out of a regular CO2 faucet. As you can see, the regular faucets are through and through. Whereas the stout faucet has these tiny little holes in it that help knock out that carbonation from the beer. So first we're gonna pour using the regular faucet. I'm just gonna get that uh, installed. So as you can see, relatively normal level of carbonation. Uh, not too much head, not too much craziness there, uh, but let's have a taste of it. I can really feel that carbonation in this. It's very, um, I wouldn't say it's harsh, but it doesn't quite belong in an Irish stout. It's, uh, it's got a lot of bubbles and it's got a lot of spritziness to it. And there's a little bit of a zip. So now I'm gonna replace this faucet with the stout faucet. You guys get bonus beer pouring footage today. So here, <laughs> As you can see, it's pouring basically straight foam, but the key is it's knocking that carbonation out of solution. So as you can see, you're getting a little cascade effect there. Um, this is, once the foam settles, this beer is going to taste so much closer to a nitro beer than that one. And I mean, the mouth feel is significantly different. It's significantly more flavorful and more balanced. Um, and you get this really rich looking head on it. Now it doesn't have that beautiful pillowy mouth feel that Nitro has. Um, you can't get that without beer gas, but it is a significantly more enjoyable beer than the regular pour. And you get 80%, if not more, of that same fluffy mouth feel uh, character. That's how I'm doing it. It's not the ideal way. You're not gonna be able to drink your beer right away because you're gonna have a mountain of foam in your glass, but it is a relatively effective way to simulate a nitro pour. And as long as you're patient and you let that head kind of condense back down, you'll have a beer that tastes and feels much more like a nitro beer as opposed to just dumping it out of a regular CO2 faucet. Anyway, enough babbling about that sort of thing. We're gonna go ahead and get to pouring this. However, <laughs> it's um, 60 degrees outside, which is Freaking weird, uh, considering we got almost two feet of snow dumped on us less than two weeks ago. Um, but, you know, New England weather. We're gonna get snow again on Sunday. It's actually just, it's weird. But hey, you know, I got daylight and I'm gonna use it. So let's go ahead and pour this beer. So the beer is called Blackened, and it comes in at 4.6% ABV and 28 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it's classic Irish stout, completely jet black, with uh, 
no ability to see through it. It's actually stark black. It has a really, really pillowy tan head on it that uh, sticks around for forever. Um, and has just a whole bunch of structure. Uh, his lacing is fantastic and the bubbles are really, really tight. So um, the head on this is great, so long as you pour it properly. The aroma, it's really, uh, it, it smells very roasty at first, um, but there's an underlying note of sweetness in there that's like a sort of semi-sweet chocolate smell. Um, it definitely smells sweeter than it's going to taste, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, overall not too bad in the aroma. Not picking up any hops or anything. Maybe there's a teeny bit of a berry. I think so. I think there's a tiny bit of berry ester in there. All right, so now we'll go in for mouthfeel. So the mouth feels pretty smooth. Um, I didn't, you know, like I said, it's very important not to overcarbonate this beer. Um, and one of the reasons is because of that mouthfeel. You got too much carbonation in there, it's going to get all spritzy and bubbly and it just tastes wrong in a, in a, you know, low alcohol stout like this. There is definitely some carbonation. Um, it's relatively smooth though. Uh, I think the flaked barley really kind of helps with that. It's definitely not nearly as full bodied as the uh, chocolate coffee stout that I made earlier a couple months ago. It's a solid media body, and I'm also not really getting all that much minerality out of it. It's actually relatively neutral, um, which is good. It makes for very easy drinking beer, uh, which is kind of the point on this one. Um, I would say it's a little less full feeling than a Guinness. And again, this is not a nitro, so it doesn't have that same kind of fluffy effect, um, but it's not bad for CO2. So now I'm going for flavor. At the beginning, there's kind of like a bit of a, a bitterness there, um, which I think is from hops. It's a little bit woody, it's a little bit um, kind of earthy, I think, but it's it's kind of hard to tell, it's just a generic kind of clean bitterness. But then on top of that, now we start getting into some nice malt flavors. There is a little bit of a biscuit undertone there, um, but there's a really solid predominant roast in this. It's like a kind of a, a coffee-like roast. It's actually relatively gentle. It's not super acrid, um, definitely not astringent at all. It definitely tastes and feels pretty dry, um, but the roast flavor is really coming through mostly as like a chocolate coffee kind of character. Um, although there's definitely some very burnt edges on that, <laughs> but that's kind of classic Irish stout. There's also a tannic kind of black tea character as well, um, which is coming through. Not the biggest fan of that, to be honest, but I've also experienced that in other Irish stouts out there as well. It's not the first time that that flavor showed up, and I think that just has to do with the sheer amount of roasted malt that we have in here. Honestly, though, that's what this beer is all about, though. It's just a strong roast character without being so overwhelming that you can't drink it, but all in a you know low alcohol, 4.5% ABV package, uh, with a nice dry finish. It's it's a solid beer to drink this time of year and um, it's low alcohol means you can have several pints. This is definitely what I was looking for when designing this Irish Stout. It tastes a lot less acrid and a lot less um, sharp and bitter than the uh, previous one that I did two years ago. So this is a definite improvement off of that one. For me though, there's definitely a few potential improvements on this one. Uh, for starters though, I think I would want a little bit more malty breadiness as a base to this. So at the risk of no longer being an Irish stout, uh, potentially per ingredients, um, I would maybe replace a pound of the Marisada that I use for base malt with a pound of say Munich malt uh, to give it a little extra dimension there. That would add some more breadiness, some more fullness to it. Um, and maybe that would help. Um, otherwise, maybe like an ounce or two of East Kent Goldings at zero, uh, just to give some nice aroma. I think that would really help balance that sort of thing out and uh, would give it a little bit more complexity, I suppose. It's a relatively simple beer, you know, it's, it doesn't have too much going on besides a couple different, you know, roast characters of chocolate and coffee um, and like, you know, burned campfire smoke. Um, but otherwise, it's, uh, it's a decent drinking beer, um, and it's you know it's it's a good beer to make for this time of year. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button and please subscribe to this channel for more content like this. Let me know in the comments section uh, what your preferred Irish stout recipe is, how that compares to what I put together here. 
If you want to support the channel, there's a variety of ways to do so. I recommend picking up a t-shirt from my t-shirt store down below the description box. You can get this one as well as many others like it. Um, and this is a great way to help support me and you get something out of it yourself. Uh, otherwise, I also have a Patreon, which is also linked down in the description box. My Patreon supporters are awesome people and they're helping drive the production behind this channel. I've made a number of upgrades over the last year due to their support. I also have an Amazon store, which is linked in the description box, where if I have used a piece of equipment and I like it, I recommend it, and it's available on Amazon, it's going to be on that store. So you can check that stuff out and buy with confidence if you're in the market for some new equipment. I also am active on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer if you want to see more frequent content updates than just YouTube. Uh, so feel free to follow me there for more stuff. Last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you very much for being here, and I really do appreciate it. So until the next one, cheers.